Good morning, everybody. Mr. Srinivas Tempo, Mr. Nikhil Sani, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to have you all with us in the opening session of the Golden Jubilee National Management Convention. Srini and Nikhil, a very warm welcome to you as we celebrate IMA's long journey to reach its 50th convention today. Your guidance and support have been invaluable in putting together the event. I'm delighted to see so many past presidents of IMA, members of IMA and IMA Council, LMA leaders, and many friends and well-wishers of IMA in, in the audience. It is very satisfying to see the management fraternity of the country coming together to celebrate this milestone occasion. I'm also delighted to share with you that we have close to 300 delegates from 50 local management associations from all over the country. Thank you all so much for joining us today. You have made this occasion for us truly special. I also want to thank our friends from the media and welcome them for our special event. Ladies and gentlemen, the National Management Convention is the flagship event of IMA, and it is the biggest occasion for India's management leadership to come together and celebrate India. The first NMC was held in 1973, and since then, every year, we have kept up this tradition of congregating and exploring the emerging opportunities and challenges for Indian management, including during two online conventions during COVID. This NMC is also special because it is taking place immediately after India's outstanding success in hosting the G20 summit. India's presidency of the G20 during the past year has reset the global agenda and put India in a position to influence the next global order. Simultaneously, Indian economy is rebounding from the cumulative effects of COVID, war and inflation. India is now in a position and as it progresses, progresses towards its century, it is time for us to dream afresh, set greater goals, and achieve higher standards. Over the next two days, we will have a galaxy of India's top leaders from government, business, technology, cinema, and the digital field to discuss the various facets of the new India and identify ways to ensure that India becomes a rich, powerful, and happy country in the coming years. We will also celebrate our Golden Jubilee through a special gala evening, and I look forward to having all of you with us for the same. IMA Awards for Excellence will be presented, and we will also induct new IMA Fellows and present the best LMA Awards over the next two days. We have a busy program through today and tomorrow, and I would urge you to stay with us all along and enjoy the NMC. But before I hand over the podium to Srini, I would like to read out a message sent to IMA with Mr. by Mr. Nitin Gadkari, Minister, Road Transport and Highways. Uh, it's a pity that most of the ministers have had to travel for the Rose Guard Mela all over the country today. So we are not uh, going to have the pleasure of their company. But Mr. Nitin Gadkari has always been very supportive of IMA and he was keen that we should read out his message to you. Uh, his message... I'm glad to know that the All India Management Association, IMA, is organizing its Golden Jubilee, that is 50th National Management Convention, on the theme Vibrant India, Reimagining the Indian Dream. Today, India is one of the fastest growing major economies and is well poised to become a developed country by 2047. IMA's role in sustaining this prestigious platform for exchange of ideas on managing the country's institutional and economic transformation is commendable. The Ministry of Transport and Highways is making a meaningful contribution in the ongoing transformation of the country's landscape and economy. The pace of building roads and infrastructure in the country has accelerated tremendously. With the spreading of expressways network and multimodal integration, we are striving to reduce logistics costs which will further boost the economy. I take this opportunity to congratulate All India Management Association on this occasion and wish them great success. So with these words, it is now my pleasure to invite the President of IMA, Mr. Srinivas Dempo, to take the podium. Thank you. A uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, Nikhil Rekha, most respected and distinguished past presidents of IMA, who have really 
uh, shown the leadership to take IMA to greater heights and serve the cause of management in the country. And uh, very enthusiastic participants, uh, council members, uh, friends from the media, and uh, members of the state associations who have joined in large numbers. I would like to add to the welcome of Rekha, and it's a privilege for me as I stand uh, here before you to welcome each and every one of you on this Golden Jubilee edition of the National Management Convention of All India Management Association. I would also like to thank you because post-COVID, you know, we have now seen that people are gathering in large numbers. Although we have an option of uh, virtual, and Rekha tells me that all the social media handles are operating for today's program, it's nothing like meeting in person and shaking hands. Uh, Nikhil, it's a pleasure to have you. I know you've traveled and landed at 2.30 in the morning today. But uh, uh, really, thank you for your support, your guidance during my year of presidentship as I pass on the baton to you tomorrow morning. And uh, I've seen your deep understanding of issues as also uh, a lot of support that came from you. Uh, we went through a very, very challenging year, as you have seen, uh, in terms of what IMA should continue to do to remain relevant to management education and to management business. Uh, I would now be relying on you uh, to sum up many of the sessions that are going to take place over the next two days. And thank you for the same. Uh, Rekha, again, a warm welcome. Uh, you have been outstanding. I know what you've gone through in the last four days. Uh, we've been virtual in the phone every day, uh, trying to rejig programs. It's not easy uh, to do a program with such high profile speakers, including honorable ministers. And Rekha and her team have really burned the midnight lamp to get this to you. So a big applause to Rekha and her team for doing this. <clears throat> also, many of the past presidents and council members have joined us. Uh, there are also many who are going to join us during these two days. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you and thank you for your leadership. Uh, as Rekha said, a large contingent of leaders from local management associations have also joined us. I've had the privilege of visiting many of you uh, during my year of uh, my tenure of IMA presidentship. And I compliment and commend the wonderful work that all of you are doing and supporting the cause of IMA, that is excellence in management. A warm welcome. I welcome many of the sponsors, IMA's mem IMA members, friends, who are with us today. Your good wishes mean a lot to us and your support is extremely important for carrying on the mission of IMA. There are thousands of people joining us online, as I have said, on various social media channels. My greetings to all of them who are watching the live stream of this convention. I also extend a very warm welcome to my friends in media who have always supported our cause and try to publicize the good work that has been done by IMA. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll try and set some context for the next two days of the National Management Convention. This convention has been one of the most important management gatherings in the country over half a century. It has evolved in its presentation and participation. And over its 50 editions now, since the first convention took place in 1973. What has not changed, however, is the NMC has always reflected the current management issues and aspirations and also the emerging challenges and opportunities for Indian economy. The Golden Jubilee is a matter of good coincidence. It really coincides with our 75 years that the Honorable Prime Minister is referred to as Amrit Kal. And the beginning of this last leg of this journey towards our becoming a powerful country and a developed country. Having achieved the critical mass for sustained growth in the coming decades, India has a new dream. We all dream of India, which is rich, powerful, and influential country. I think all of us will admit there's a new vibrancy in India, and not even the multiple global crises that all of us know have interfered with the bullish mood of the nation. It's only appropriate that the Golden Jubilee edition of the NMC provides a stage for discussing the different facets and dimension for, it to, for India to unleash its new potential. 
it's a happy coincidence also that India just hosted the G20 summit and made a very big impression on the world. What was unique is our Honorable Prime Minister decided to take it not only to major cities like Delhi and Mumbai, but to various nooks and parts of the country. The summit brought to India very powerful global leaders, and most of these leaders went back with a strong impression of India's progress and future potential. The fact that India got everyone to sign the summit declaration has been heralded as a new shift, as a sign of the shift in the global order and India's arrival as a world leader. India's economy is the key to India's place and role in the world. As all of you know, India is already the fifth largest economy in the world and very soon progressing to become the third largest. Still, India's spell on the world is based on its potential to become the engine of the global economic growth and grow to a level where it becomes, if not the largest, the second largest economy. According to Reserve Bank of India, Indian economy grows, needs to grow at an average of 7.6% till 2047 to become a developed country. India's per capita GDP needs to multiply about nine times over the next 25 years to achieve this status. To get there, Indian economy needs a rebalancing by raising the share of manufacturing in its output to almost about one third. All this requires an exponentially rising investment in sectors such as infrastructure, technology, education, skills, health, and a major realignment of management and both governance. India, I think, is moving in the right direction and the progress is also gathering momentum. There's a lot going for India. Not only had, has it become one of the most powerful and biggest economies in the world, the biggest attraction for global companies, it's got a lot of headroom for growth. The world is looking at India's new status as the most populous country, but at the same time, the world's youngest population. Investors and businesses across the globe are fascinated by India's consumption potential. Also, India is expected to add uh, or have nearly 1.4 billion people of the working age in 2030. Given the mismatch available between the workforce and the economy's labor absorption capacity, India is also looking extremely attractive for manufacturing and production. Average wage increases will trail average consumption capacity in India, and that is an extremely compelling proposition for Make in India. India's rentless investment in infrastructure, both physical and digital, is an assurance of even greater economic expansion in the coming years. Indian economy has attained a critical mass and it has reached a stage where it can shift more resources to support the population's income generation capacity rather than the survival of a large poor section. India has now, I'm told, has got the second largest roads and highways network in the world and its already enormous railways network is set to support faster and better movement of people and merchandise. All of you know we have the CEO of Indigo who is soon going to speak to you. India's aviation infrastructure is taking off. India is the fastest growing commercial aviation market in the world and is close to having the capacity to be a regional transit hub for both air passengers and cargo. India's public digital infrastructure is a huge story. I was told that many of the countries by some of the bureaucrats are requesting India to help them with the unified payment mechanism. We are already the second largest mobile phone users in the world and the largest number of digital payments in the world. In, even as Indian economy runs on afterburners, it's also going green and that's the journey that we have to traverse. India is a major user of coal for producing electricity, but also one of the biggest producers of renewable energy. And the balance is progressing, progressively shifting in favor of green energy. India is said to be one of the largest producers and users of electric vehicles. I think Tata Motors has done a wonderful job uh, by producing some of the best uh, electric vehicles. And as Indian companies, we should be proud of such companies who are uh, doing this uh, for consumption in India to the Indian consumer. The policy clearly tilts in favor of electrification of personal vehicles 
and that is yet another big driver of India's growth. We also know that India is increasingly looked upon as an alternative to China, but yet the biggest challenge that we have is to really copy or the scale of China that China has achieved in various sectors. I think these are all topics that we need to review over the next two days. We have great speakers. We have some of the brightest minds in India who are going to talk to you, debate with you on the relevance of uh, economic progress in India and how it will affect every single member or every single consumer in India. I think everything seems to be falling in place for India, yet we must remember there are internal and external risks that need to be addressed. India's demographic dividend can only be encashed if the billion strong Indian youth is skillfully employed and equipped with advanced knowledge and know-how. It's also that we need to find out land for large-scale investments, infrastructure which is seamless, and finance which is easily accessible. Also, we need to see management is efficient, is a management's efficiency and quality oriented. The social and regional balances as we expand and as we develop are also critical to ensure that growth is not disrupted by friction. Such risks need to be addressed because India's time is imminent and also, but not inevitable. We have seen many examples of the world where countries had so many opportunities but they were frittered away by their chances. India's dream of becoming rich, influential, and powerful needs to include elements of inclusion, diversity, and equality. And I hope all these subjects will be discussed. Over the, these couple of days, the convention, I hope, will explore India's new possibilities across spectrum of verticals and discuss the various elements of Indian dream. I welcome you once again and also uh, Rekha has already talked about the awards night, the gala night tonight. We are going to felicitate and honor some of the best minds in India and hope you can join us for this evening. Have a wonderful convention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dempo, for your inspirational address. Ladies and gentlemen, we now give away some key recognition and awards. May I request the dignitaries on the dais to please come forward and center to present the IMA Fellowship and IMA Awards. The first key presentation is the conferment of the IMA Fellowship. A distinguished academic leader, he has left an indelible mark on marketing and business education as Dean at the Indian School of Business and in key roles at Singapore Management University, Emory University and the University of Texas at Austin. He has shown visionary leadership and commitment to interdisciplinary research and industry collaboration. His outstanding contributions to marketing led to his 2020 recognition as an American Marketing Association Fellow. Notably, his 1998 Journal of Marketing article Market-Based Asset and Shareholder Value won the Maynard, MSI, Paul Root and IMA Shade Foundation Awards simultaneously. Despite his heavy administrative responsibilities, he has been active in the classroom in each of the last 45 years as a pracademic, a practical academic. His thought leadership credentials are underscored by over 27,000 Google Scholar citations, the highest for a marketing academic from India. All India Management Association is pleased to present the IMA Fellowship to Dr. Rajendra Srivastava, Novartis Professor of Marketing Strategy and Innovation at the Indian School of Business. Please give a huge big round of applause. The next award is the Aima R.K. Swami High Performance Brand Award 2023. 
May I invite on stage Mr. Srinivasan K. Swami, past president IMA and chairman and managing director R.K. Swami Private Limited to announce and introduce the winner of this award. President Mr. Srinivas Tempo, my good friend Nikhil, Rekha, I must com compliment IMA on this important landmark, 50th National Management Convention is no small task. I remember when I was very, very young, M.K. Raju was the president then, and he and my father actually put this program together in Chennai. It's come a long way, so congratulations again to the leadership at Aima for having this kind of performance. I'm here to talk about R.K. Swami, Aima R.K. Swami High Performance Brand Award. You know, my father has been a nationalist and he felt always that Indian companies should actually make a mark on the global stage. It was in this context that we actually instituted this award in the year 2009. And we decided to give to companies who outperformed their competition or performed most parameters that, that the industry would look at. And the last 13 years or 14 years, we gave away 13 awards to very, very worthy companies like the SBI, LIAC, Titan, Amul, Tata, Bajaj Auto, HDFC Bank and all that. We have a worthy win winner this year too, in the name of Mahindra and Mahindra. Mahindra has been having a great run the last three years. Uh, its revenue grew from, from about 44,500 crores two years ago to 85,000 crores last year. Profit is also gone up multiple times from about 1,000 crores to about 6,500 crores in two years' time. So I'm very, very happy to announce that IMA, RK from my performance brand, brand award, will be awarded to Mahindra and Mahindra for the year 2022. Thank you. Congratulations to Mahindra and Mahindra Limited team. And thank you, Mr. Swami, for introducing the winner. The award is being received by Ms. Neha Anand. I would request Ms. Anand to kindly say a few words. Thank you so much uh, for this prestigious uh, award. This is a very special moment uh, considering the theme for today's Vibrant India. And I think Mahindra over the last two years has really tried to bring in the vibrancy in their products in the way we've tried to position ourselves. So just a very short vote of thanks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of AIMA, RK Swami Group, dignitaries and fellow awardees. It is with immense pride and gratitude that I stand before you today to accept the AIMA RK Swami High Performance Brand Award on behalf of Mahindra and Mahindra. Our focus to deliver innovative and cutting edge product offerings along with the ability to onboard a new segment of customers who are an integral part of Progressive India has not only helped us reposition our brand but also contributed to a great overall performance in the last two years. With the consumer at the core of our operations, we are constantly striving to make sure that we progress year on year. This year's theme, Vibrant India, reimagining the Indian dream, resonates deeply with the ethos of Mahindra. As we reimagine the Indian dream, we envision a nation that is not only vibrant, but also sustainable, inclusive, and technologically advanced. Mahindra's commitment to a net zero future is a testament to our dedication to creating a greener and cleaner India. We are humbled to be recognized for our efforts 
and pledge to continue working towards a vibrant India together with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Anand. To mark the convention each year, AIMA takes out a special souvenir with interesting articles on management trends. May I now request the honorable dignitaries on the stage to release the convention souvenir. Thank you all for doing the honors and many thanks to all those who have contributed to the souvenir. May I now request Mr. Nikhil Sani to deliver the concluding remarks. Uh, very good morning, everyone. Srini, Rekha. Uh, Srini, it's really appropriate that we're celebrating AIMA's Golden Jubilee NMC with your presidentship. It's really been a pleasure to get to know you and work with you. And I look forward to the support over the coming year. But it's really been a year where, where you have put the priorities of India forward. And ladies and gentlemen, we must recognize the work that Srini has put in. And I request you to put a, give a round of applause to Srini for a wonderful year. <laughs> to all the past presidents here as well, many thank you for being here. Many thanks. And to all the other distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Rekha, it's been a wonderful start to the NMC. And I look forward to the deliberations over the next couple of days. Ladies and gentlemen, this is India's century. And as Srini had pointed out, everything points towards a great future for India. It's time to think big and dream big. It's a time to raise our expectations and performance. It's time to bring it all together to make India one of the best countries and Indians amongst the finest people in the world. The numbers say it all, as Srinir already pointed out, India now has, is the most populous country in the world and with nearly a billion strong workforce. We will really be leading the productivity of the years to come. India is already the fifth largest economy in the world and is set to become the third largest within the near future. India's GDP is nearing $4 trillion and is on the cusp of achieving the milestone of the important $5 trillion. At this time, when global economic growth is decelerating, India's GDP growth is set to accelerate and stay above 6.5% in the foreseeable future. The world looks towards India, both from the economic as well as geopolitical leadership and amid economic and geopolitical troubles. With expectations of high growth in GDP for the coming decade and further, India is seen as a provider of both demand and supply to the global economy. India is seen as a safe haven in a world where geopolitical tensions are casting a dark shadow on global trade routes, supply chains, and technology trust. The world is coming to India for competitive, reliable, and trustworthy supplies, as well as innovations. India is at the center of the new international formations to secure trade routes in the Indian Ocean and is the anchor of the proposed new multimodal trade routes connecting India to West Asia and Europe. India is also critical to saving the world from climate change. Even as India is using fossil fuels to fire up its own economy, it is also a major driver for the green growth movement. India is decarbonizing its economy and making its growth less emission intensive by nudging industry and consumers to shift to greener options. In fact, the cleaning and greening of the economy is critical for realizing the new Indian dream. Polluted and increasingly hotter working and living environments are affecting the health and productivity of the population. The changing patterns of floods and droughts are destabilizing populations in different parts of the country, and the environment driven migrations are distorting regional economies. India yearns for cleaner air, cooler temperatures, adequate safe drinking water, and land free from threats of extreme water scarcity or excesses. Instead of being defensive, India's response has been proactive. India has signed the Paris Climate Accord and to, to reduce its carbon emissions by 45% by 2030 and to eventually achieve a net zero emission 
by 2070. India is targeting 500 gigawatts of renewable energy production by 2030 and subsequently increasing it to over 1,000 gigawatts. India is investing in grid batteries to ensure that solar and wind power become viable alternatives for round-the-clock power supply. But as India grows, we have to base our requirements on energy consumption and our energy in a world which consumes approximately 600 exajoules of energy annually is only 36 exajoules. The reason I point out the nomenclature of exajoules is that we are fixed on determining our consumption of energy in terms of watts. And very frankly, as a country that needs to grow and increase its consumption of all forms of energy, principally heating and cooling, but also in forms of logistics, we need to expand our definition of how energy is consumed and therefore come up with newer innovations of systems whereby we can ensure the greater degree of participation of our citizens in this greener energy world that we live in. But Indian companies are leading the way and are making voluntary efforts to satisfy their consumers and the general public by switching to clean, cleaner processes and greener processes and practices as well. They are transitioning to more energy and emission efficient technologies. This is supported by an ecosystem which fosters a more responsible view towards a green economy. And the Securities and Exchange Board of India is, reinforces this with the business respons responsibility and sustainability reporting on companies with practically all large market capitalized, market capitalized companies participating in this BRSR report. But it is known that this will stretch to all companies in the near future. And so it is important for us to recognize the responsibility that businesses play within the ecosystem of a green economy. There is a sense of inevitability about India's rise in the coming couple of decades and its new place and role in the world. The circumstances require India to reimagine its aspirations and recalibrate its actions. Given the historic experience of great opportunities tend to be ephemeral, India needs to get its act together now and bring the future forward instant, instead of fantastically relying on the world to make it great. Much as we have leapfrogged in the digital world, there are several innovations that we need to put to the forefront so that we can, as a country, become a developed economy in the shortest time frame and especially by the timeline set by the government of 2047. The new Indian dream is about enabling high standards of knowledge, know-how, innovation, and income for a billion and a half people. The new dream has to be about providing economic, scientific, and political leadership in a world and steering it to a more cooperative and safer future. The key to making such a dream a reality is to remain humble, reasonable, and accommodating as a nation. Even as we celebrate our wins, we need to stay focused on the next challenges and missions. And I'm confident that the new India has a good balance of ambition and wisdom, and the new Indian dream will only get bigger and more viable in the times to come. I thank everyone in the audience for joining us today in the opening session of this convention and helping us kick off the Golden Jubilee edition of the NMC. The convention is devoted to celebrating a vibrant India and its confidence to dream big. We are all in it together and I appreciate your enthusiasm in coming in such a large number to show your support and commitment to India's cause. A big thank you to every one of you who is here today as well as who are joining us online. The aviation boom is a big story and in, and in the new econ Indian economy, we will drive further and delve deeper into the subject of this high-flying sector with our next session. Please stay with us and in your seats for our conversation with Mr. Peter Elbers, the CEO of Indigo. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.